This is Climate One. I'm Greg Dalton. A functional democracy is vital to ameliorating the climate crisis. What happens when the right to vote comes under attack? If you're able to repress the vote in a way that people that are committed to these issues can't get elected, and you keep electing a a majority in state legislatures and in Congress that is totally beholden to the fossil fuel industry, you won't get anywhere. If Congress won't act, can the president? The president has a tremendous amount of executive powers. So some of those are emergency powers, but many of those are actually ordinary powers. He can actually take many steps in banning fossil fuel leasing, or at the very least, reducing the rate at which it's happening right now. Biodiversity, climate, and the courts. Up next on Climate One. Historically, the United States has been the world's biggest carbon emitter. That legacy puts a certain onus on the U.S. to be the world leader in addressing the climate crisis. In order to do that, our elected representatives need to make climate a priority. Yet at the same time, voting rights are being restricted for the very communities most affected by the climate crisis, Blacks, Indigenous Americans, and people of color. Climate issues are also being decided by the courts, where ordinary citizens have much less direct impact. When so many levers of power are pulled in the wrong direction, can a broken democracy heal a broken climate? While serving as a U.S. Senator from Wisconsin, Russ Feingold became a household name by co-authoring the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act, more commonly known as McCain-Feingold. It took effect in 2002 and is the only major piece of federal campaign finance reform passed into law in decades. In that political era, climate action also had bipartisan support. John McCain and Barack Obama were in basically the same place when it came to climate issues in 2008. That same year, a TV ad featured Nancy Pelosi and Newt Gingrich sitting on a couch together. Hi, I'm Nancy Pelosi lifelong Democrat and Speaker of the House. And I'm Newt Gingrich, lifelong Republican, and I used to be Speaker. We don't always see eye to eye, do we, Newt? No, but we do agree our country must take action to address climate change. We need cleaner forms of energy, and we need them fast. If enough of us demand action from our leaders, we can spark the innovation we need. Go to WeCanSolveIt.org. Together, we can do this. I asked Senator Feingold what he felt when he watched that ad. It makes me very sad to think about the fact that we don't have that kind of cooperation now. Speaker Gingrich was not the easiest guy to get along with on issues, but the fact that uh, Speaker Pelosi and Speaker Gingrich were able to come together in this reminds me of really, frankly, what I grew up with here, which was a Wisconsin tradition. We had Republicans and we had Democrats. But when it came to the thing we called conservation, before we called it environmentalism. Everybody just put aside those differences. Our, our famous governors, Warren Knowles and Gaylord Nelson, both you know, both governors, but one Republican, one Democrat, were symbols of the cooperation on these issues, preserving national natural lands. It just wasn't a partisan issue. And when I got to Congress, it was still that way. I got there in 1992, but on so many issues, a lot of the Democrats and Republicans we're willing to work together. And I mean, that's how Gaylord Nelson was able to pass as a senator uh, the Clean Water Act and the Endangered Species Act and, and the Clean Air Act, all those things in the 60s. And in fact, Richard Nixon created the Environmental Protection Agency. It's, it's not like he was an anti-environmentalist, but things sharply changed, Greg, uh, at some point in the late 2000s. And uh, I think we both know what it was. It was a direct attempt to take climate out of the sphere of bipartisanship and to turn it into a, uh, a partisan bloodbath led by some very powerful corporate interests, which I'm sure we'll talk about. But it really changed things to the point where we have a, a really bad divide on this issue and almost nothing seems to get done, at least at the national level, with regard to climate change. Yeah, so much was happening around that time, 2006 to 10 in there. I believe Freedom House, uh, has, which charts the, the freedom of governments around the world, they started to see a decline in free democracies around the world around that 06, and it's it shrunk then. One other big thing there, 2010, the Supreme Court handed down Citizens United that undid the 2002 McCain-Feingold restrictions 
on campaign finance and allowed unlimited funds to be poured into elections. You know, how do you connect that with what other changes, the fossil fuel companies, things that were going on at that time? Well, you're right that it was the the rise of the Tea Party after, uh, as President Obama was coming into office that somehow became identified not only with being against a health care bill that hadn't even been introduced yet uh, and claiming that President Obama was born overseas, but a third uh, part of it was a concerted attack that I have witnessed personally on any attempt to try to do something about this legislatively, the so-called cap and trade legislation was attacked as a socialist plot that would destroy the economy. So as I did these town meetings in 2009 and 2010, I was shocked at the disinformation. This is key because the disinformation, as we know right now, is a big part of the overall authoritarian strategy in the world and the attack on democracy. This was one of the first experiments with it, led by the tobacco companies first with regard to smoking. Right. And we, yeah, we saw that there. And then the, you know, the rise of the Tea Party, you know, do you think that, uh, you know, people of color would often say that um, they knew that electing a black man would bring a big racial backlash? Do you think, what part do you think race played in that? I'm sad to say that I think race played way too much a part. You know, I literally made a promise when I ran for the U.S. Senate in 1992 that every year, I would go to each of Wisconsin's 72 counties and hold an open town meeting. And we did it for 18 years. But all of a sudden, after Obama was elected, before he was even sworn in, all of a sudden, all these angry people that I'd never seen before came in and started saying that he was a socialist and he was going to do this and he was going to do that. And they actually scared people away, people that came every year. They were always very uh, mild sessions where if anybody sort of it tended to be more liberals because of who, who I am. But whenever somebody came in and was a conservative, I made sure the crowd treated that person with respect. And all of a sudden, these things became screaming sessions. And you could see that across the country at that point. So this was part of the strategy. Disinformation, disrupt public meetings where people could come together. And yes, even in some of the rural counties where a lot of, I thought, a lot of liberals lived over near the Mississippi River, I remember some of the people that I understood to be progressives on the environment saying, hey, this climate change thing is a hoax. Right. And of course, calling cap and trade a socialist plot is pretty ironic because cap and trade was the Wall Street friendly version of tackling climate change. It was favored by big business. <laughs> exactly. Well, when President Obama came in, he famously decided to tackle health care first in his first term ahead of climate. Partly that was gas prices were very high and people were angry. Now President Biden once again is putting the transition to cleaner energy a bit to the side as he looks to the midterms and worries about high gas prices. So what do you think about the political calculus right now of mm, we got to drill more, increase fossil fuel supply, get prices down. Climate's important, but we can't put it first right now. Well, you're right. This just keeps happening. And it's incredibly important that we deal with the climate issue, as well as, I might add, the biodiversity issue, which is a related issue that was also an outgrowth of the Rio conference in 1992, where those treaties were initiated. And somehow these things get put on the back burner. And you can understand why. Look, I know when Barack Obama became president, I knew that he was on the right issue on health care because every year for 18 years that I did town meetings, health care was the thing that people most mentioned problem with the climate issue, as you know, even though there were heroic efforts by people like Al Gore and others to make it sort of accessible, is that it is more complicated. It's harder to connect to on a day-to-day basis. You can see the strange things going on with the climate, but it's so heavily laden with science and complexities that it's, it's, it's real fertile ground if people want to try to distort things, particularly when something like this might involve sacrifice. If you can convince people, you know, you don't really need to do this. There's always been climate change. It's no big deal. Well, people would rather hear that than that they're going to have to sacrifice for it. And and so that's, it creates kind of a Sisyphus kind of situation where you keep pushing this boulder up the hill. Yeah, the costs are today and the benefits are in the future. And we're not very good at that in our political cultures. Like we want benefits today and the costs tomorrow or never. I believe fervently in democracy, but you're right. The, the fact that we do have these regular elections and we're frequently changing hands, it's very hard 
for political people to be able to sit down and draft up a, a long-term vision. You know, frankly, the Chinese are much better at it, but they do it in a very autocratic way that ultimately may backfire on them because they're trying so hard to preserve the dominance of the party. But they are able to exude an environmental or an industrial or a foreign policy out 10, 15 years. So this is one of the great challenges of democracy in this uh, interdependent age is how do you plan forward when you know that it could go back and forth, we may have another huge shift this year politically that could stop in the tracks of even what President Biden is trying to do in this area. Right. And you spend a lot of time on foreign affairs, particularly Africa. Right now, what's happening in Ukraine is roiling energy markets. It's changing geopolitics. It's changing domestic politics. There's a real debate on whether it means more drilling, more fossil fuels, or does it mean pivot to green and more renewables? How do you see that dynamic and that playing out right now, both internationally and domestically? There's a great moment of transition and turmoil. You know, there's an element of it that, that I'm optimistic about, and that is that 10, 15 years ago, people said, you know, solar and all this stuff, it's never going to work. It's never going to turn a profit. Yet That's not true anymore. There are all kinds of places and all kinds of companies that are finding it to be uh, not only uh, useful, but lucrative in some cases. So we're in a better position to not kid ourselves that the only way to do it is through fossil fuels. But the fossil fuels industry still has such a domination over our political process because of the bias in our political process that is not based on the majority of people. That still gives a huge advantage to fossil fuel industry being able to defeat serious uh, measures at whether the federal or state level. And that's a political problem and a legal problem as well as an environmental problem. Well, um, we're seeing this moment now where there are some Democrats who are saying, you know, uh, when President Biden was a candidate, Biden, he was kind of moderate on climate. He kind of he moved as a candidate, got a lot more uh, in tune with environmental and, and climate justice. You bucked your party at, at times and were were kind of a, a bit of a maverick. At one point, you were the only Democratic senator to vote against your party on a procedural motion during the Clinton impeachment. How do you look at Democrats on the left now, whether it's the squad or Sunrise, who are trying to push the party, yet that is that jeopardizing reaching swing voters and swing districts? Um, how do you see that? I believe that pushing on the climate issue, as well as biodiversity, in the end is, is a winner with voters. And it would, it would be a mistake for progressives, whether Republican or Democrat, to back away from it. I still think there is a fundamental common sense view that uh, this is worth doing. The, the problem with the fossil fuel industry is not so much what they're able to do during an election. It's what they're able to do after the election when people get elected. So in terms of election strategy, I, I think people should be plenty firm and strong with regard to the vital need to act uh, aggressively with regard to climate Redistricting is happening this year, a lot happening in the courts. You're focused on, on the courts somewhat. How do you view what's happened in the courts with regard to redistricting and the kind of battling over the, the rules of the next election? Yeah, if people wonder how is it that, you know, the majority of people believe that climate change is a serious problem, and the majority of people want various environmental measures, how is it that that's the case and that you still end up with legislatures all over the country that are hell-bent on preventing serious climate change legislation. In fact, we had incidents here in Wisconsin where they would even try to make sure that nobody in the state government was allowed to mention the phrase climate change, including the daughter of former Senator Gaylord Nelson, the founder of Earth Day. They tried to punish her for that. How does that happen? Well, it's through reapportionment. It's through gerrymandering. Let me give you an example. You know, we had a Republican governor and Republican legislature consistently from 2010 to 2018, and they did lots of bad things, uh, undoing a labor movement, undoing collective bargaining. But in 2018, the Democrats had a good election. They won the governorship here, the lieutenant governorship, the state treasurer, and the attorney general. It was a clear Democratic majority. Guess what? In the legislature, not only did Democrats not pick up ground, they lost ground in both the House and the Senate, uh, the Assembly and the Senate. The same voters. Why is that? Because the districts were, par in a partisan way, redone so that the votes of Democrats, particularly African Americans in the uh, southeastern part of the state, were, were minimized. 
And a case was taken all the way to the United States Supreme Court based on the Wisconsin case, as well as others, saying, you know, this is this is something that shouldn't be allowed. And unfortunately, this court, as in so many other cases, said, no, actually, uh, you know, uh, that's fine. You can do it on a partisan basis. So what happened is, even though clearly a majority of the people of this state want action in this area, it can't get done. And so now the Supreme Court has intervened again, as we're about to have the decision made about what the lines are going to be for the next 10 years. And in this case, Greg, our Wisconsin Supreme Court did the right thing at first. One of the conservative justices said, this isn't right. And he voted with the progressives. And he said, with regard to the state legislative uh, program, the governor's plan should be used. Well, guess what? The United States Supreme Court and the shadow docket, without even having an oral argument, without even really having a briefing, quietly struck it down. And they went back to the Supreme Court and they went the other way. So what does that mean? Ten more years of the frustrations of the will of the people of Wisconsin, ten more years of gerrymandering, and ten more years of very unlikely progress on environmental issues, including climate change. You're listening to a Climate One conversation about climate and democracy. My guest is former U.S. Senator Russ Feingold. Coming up, shining a light on another climate-related crisis, the loss of biodiversity. The two issues should be linked and that there should be more awareness of the biodiversity, which I actually hope will somehow be more bipartisan than the climate one has been. That's up next when Climate One continues. This is Climate One. I'm Greg Dalton, and we're talking about climate and democracy with Russ Feingold. In addition to being an honorary ambassador for the Campaign for Nature, Feingold is president of the American Constitution Society, a network of progressive lawyers. The courts play a major role in how the climate crisis can be addressed, from defining EPA authority to allowing unlimited spending in political campaigns. We taped our conversation with Senator Feingold before the leaked Supreme Court draft decision overturning Roe v. Wade and Planned Parenthood v. Casey. Many have pointed to this as an example of the continued politicization of the nation's highest court. It's also worth pointing out that overturning those cases, long considered settled law, might demonstrate how the current conservative majority could reverse other decisions such as Massachusetts versus EPA, which ruled the agency can regulate carbon emissions under the Clean Air Act. I asked Feingold what can be done about the power of Supreme Court justices, like expanding the court or instituting term limits. Well, we at the American Constitution Society think that there is a new momentum for this. And, you know, the president had a commission about judicial reform. And some of the people went into it thinking that, well, it's not a good idea to expand the court. Well, some of the most prominent people that felt that way changed their mind, particularly Nancy Gertner and Lawrence Tribe, two of the most distinguished constitutional lawyers from Harvard Law School. They wrote an op-ed afterwards saying, you know what? We thought maybe term limits would be better. And by the way, we support term limits for members of the Supreme Court. But they also concluded that the only way to undo the packing of the court that was done by Trump and and McConnell is to add some seats, which, of course, is perfectly constitutional. It can be done and has been done in the past. And it's the only way to change the fact that essentially a seat was stolen from Obama and a seat was stolen in advance from Biden. So we support both of those kinds of measures to to do something about the damage that the court is doing, including recently in the environmental area. And we also support internal reforms such as, you know, the court doesn't have ethics rules. The court court doesn't have, uh, the court has this shadow docket that I mentioned that's being abused. It's supposed to be for emergency situations. So all of this sets the stage for real damage to the environmental issue as well as others. In fact, they used the shadow docket last week to undercut the Clean Water Act. I spoke recently with Congressman Jamie Raskin when I asked him what parts of the federal government are best empowered to take strong action on climate right now. He answered that it all comes back to Congress and the country's founders put the legislature in Article I of the Constitution as a former senator now focused on the courts. How do you answer that question about where, what part of government can best address climate? I think Congressman Raskin is right. The, 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 the purpose of, of the Congress is to address through legislation, working with the president, the, the, the problems that face our society. Um, of course, when it comes to the interpretation of individual rights and others, that's, that's more the job of the court. 
But, you know, John McCain and I spent eight years working together on legislation to reform our campaign finance system. And as you pointed out, the, uh, a, a court struck down not our bill, but actually but something else, but did great damage because they didn't respect the role of the legislature, an overwhelming bipartisan consensus on that issue. Well, the same thing goes for climate. If we just leave it up to a court, a court that is basically six to three, based on the theft of two Supreme Court seats, we're going to get nowhere. And people on the left often point to the politicization of, of the court and activist jurists. And yet, I also want to ask you if it was a mistake or appropriate for people on the left to make Ruth Bader Ginsburg a cultural icon. Documentaries, buttons, you know, she became kind of a, a you know, a, a hero and a pop culture figure. Is that appropriate for a justice? Does that contribute to the politicization? And perhaps also her staying for longer didn't work out so well in the end. You know, I don't think it's, a, she certainly deserved the accolades and the admiration that she got for her role in the court, for his her wonderful role model for women. I mean, I don't have a particular problem with that. However, I do think the spectacle of her having to hang on when she was obviously very ill was part of the problem with the way our court is set up. And it's one of the reasons we at the American Constitution Society support the idea of perhaps an 18-year term limit. In other words, uh, one idea that's out there, and I think it's pretty good, is that every president should get to pick two justices, once every two or more, one, two a term. That would create regularity, and the person would not necessarily have to stop being a judge. They might go on senior status, sit in the Court of Appeals, et cetera. I think it's time for that. Now, that may require a constitutional amendment, unlike adding seats. It's a debate. I'm not sure I agree. I think it may not, which would be, of course, very challenging. But I thought what happened with the wonderful Ruth Bader Ginsburg was a sign of something that clearly the founders didn't intend for somebody of, of that age and that health condition to have to hang on literally for dear life, hoping that a different president would get to pick her successor. And that's where uh, McConnell and Trump were simply craven by rushing through an appointment while people were already voting for the next president. That's one of the worst things I've ever seen. It was wrong. They know it was wrong. And it's not something I ever would have believed on either side. You know, I was on the Judiciary Committee for four major Supreme Court appointments. And so I went through that whole process. I never saw anything like this done by either side. Two of them were under Bush, the second Bush. Two of them were under Obama. It was a civil appropriate process, and that's been ruined. Right. And certainly you could argue, well, uh, Garland, like no, no uh, approvals in, in election years or or yes, do it close to an election. But it's hard to ar argue b both of those. In Shelby County versus Holder, the Supreme Court struck down key provisions of the 65 Voting Rights Act in a 5-4 decision. How are the rollback of voting rights and environmental rights and protections connected? Well, you got me wound up on reapportionment, and you're going to do it again on Shelby County. So, look, the Voting Rights Act, heroic success of Lyndon Johnson and others after many years of tremendous effort, had long been a wonderful bipartisan issue, like many environmental issues. The votes were overwhelming to re uh, authorize the Voting Rights Act every five years. One of the most conservative congressmen in Wisconsin history, James Sensenbrenner, who considered me a pain in the neck and I considered him a pain in the neck most of the time, he was wonderful on this. He Every time he would work meticulously to make sure a good Voting Rights Act was passed, and that happened again uh, before Shelby County. Here, this unelected court, this time led by Chief Justice Roberts, sadly, decided to start dismantling it. They uh, eliminated the pre-clearance requirement. Now, what's that? Pre-clearance requirement was that certain places with histories of Jim Crow laws and racism had to get their voting procedures cleared in advance. He basically said, you know, racism is not a problem anymore in voting. Well, that unleashed a terrible torrent of anti-voting laws, including here in the state of Wisconsin, trying to eliminate, eliminate early voting, trying to require voter ID, limiting the number of polling places, doing everything possible to make it difficult for people to vote in addition to the reapportionment and the gerrymandering that we've already talked about. And now they're doing more. Now they're weakening other provisions of the Voting Rights Act. And the Branovich decision out of Arizona uh, this past year 
they made it very hard for people living on reservations and other places to have older, you know, very elderly people having their ballots transported by somebody else in a secure way. And now they're talking about uh, some of the justices eliminating the ability to enforce the Voting Rights Act through what's called the private right of action, which is where an individual, as opposed to an attorney general, can bring the case. So this is a full scale attack on the most fundamental right we have. And yes, of course, it's completely related to environmental and climate issues, just like reapportionment. If you're able to repress the vote in a way that people that are committed to these issues can't get elected, and you keep electing a, a majority in state legislatures and in Congress that is totally beholden to the fossil fuel industry, you won't get anywhere. So voting rights repression and attack on voting rights is one of the most pernicious things in our society. And it's being led by the United States Supreme Court, which is supposed to stand up for the right to vote. The independent state legislature doctrine is a belief that state legislatures are the only governing bodies who can determine how elections are run with no input from state courts or governors. How serious a threat to democracy is the independent state legislature doctrine? Well, whenever you hear one of these things the first time, you know, before you realize the money behind it and what they're going to do, Federalist Society and others, you go, that sounds crazy because it is crazy. The idea is that the legislature can simply make up the rules or take election results, install election officials, and that the courts in the states can't even review it. The idea that they do something that's blatantly illegal or unconstitutional and the state court or the Supreme Court can't review it is absurd. And yet they're advancing it. And there is a reason to believe, potentially, that as many as four of the members of the Supreme Court already support it. So this would gut our democracy. It would be totally autocratic. And so it's a dangerous doctrine. I think it's totally wrong. And it would undo our, essentially would undo the idea of our democracy at its core. There is bipartisan support for reforming the, the Electoral Count Act. You know, what impact would that have? And is that kind of fighting the last war? Well, you have to at least fight that war. It's not enough, but at least to, there is bipartisan support for that. That would at least prevent the kind of stunt that, that apparently President Trump and his allies were trying to pull on January 6th. For so many years, we've been concerned about first getting people out to vote, encouraging people to vote. Then, as you pointed out, we became concerned after Shelby, especially Shelby County decision, we became concerned about voter suppression trying to prevent people from voting. But now we're in a whole nother world. The ballots have already been submitted and people say, well, we don't like what they're saying about who uh, won. We're going to subvert the election. We're going to have people put on ele uh, electors for the electoral college who don't even believe in the results. And so this is a whole nother level, an even more dangerous level that frankly, progressives have to step up to the plate and fight this at the precinct level. We have initi initiated a new program at the American Constitution si Society the last few weeks to get people to pledge to be poll workers. Because a lot of our poll workers, you know, a lot of these people have been doing this for 34 years, 30, 40 years, wonderful local community people. They're scared to go to the polls because they think it might be a place where there's going to be uh, rough stuff, maybe even violence. And so we're encouraging our lawyers and others to say, I'll volunteer. Uh, and, and we need to do that. Otherwise, this intimidation will grow. And one of the things I want to point out is when you intimidate, you don't just intimidate the poll workers. A lot of people, you know, a lot of older people, a lot of people that aren't used to politics, they look at that and they go, you know, I don't think I'm going to go down to that polling place. It doesn't, I don't really feel that strongly about it. And that's how the big interests and those who want to suppress our society and even fascist interests can prevail. Yeah, especially for people who are immigrants from uh, countries that have different forms of government, have some personal experience of repression or the et cetera. Uh, I could easily be scared off by that. Most of our listeners are probably familiar with the Conference of Parties or COP on climate change. Last year it was in Glasgow. This year it's coming up in Egypt. But there's also a Conference on Parties to the UN Convention on Biological Diversity, which you've been deeply involved with. So why is biodiversity so much less in the public spotlight than climate? They're related, but climate seems to get a lot of the attention. If you can believe it, Greg, we're like the only country in the world that hasn't ratified the Convention on Biodiversity. I mean, Russia's done it. China's done it. China is hosting 
the um, conference in Kunming for this. So it's it's very embarrassing, but it's because you need that two thirds vote in the Senate. Now, the United States has recently joined what we call the High Ambition Coalition through our administration, which is trying to get the goal established at, in Kunming, kind of like the climate goal of one point five degrees. This goal is that thirty percent of the planet, water and land, will be preserved by twenty thirty. Now, the scientists say we need, may need to do more than that, but it's based on a report done by a couple hundred top-notch scientists released in May of 2019 that says that we are going to lose potentially a million species to extinction in the coming years. And the report says that the loss of, of biodiversity, of course, animals, but also you know, plants and, and you know, fungi and all kinds of things like that, that that loss could be as serious as climate change. And of course, the two are totally interrelated. I mean, if you look at the lo loss to the coral reefs, that is caused, that's a loss of biodiversity caused significantly by the warming of the water. Vice versa, damage to the climate if you have the exploitation of the Congolese forest, which is the second, some people call it the second lung of the planet after the Amazon. You get rid of those trees, you don't just lose the biodiversity of the trees. It's no longer a sink for the CO2. It no longer does the, that. So most of the people that I've talked to about this around the world, and we are working as an international group, agree that the two issues should be linked and that there should be more awareness of the biodiversity, which I actually hope will somehow be more bipartisan than the climate one has been. A lot of this uh, 30 by 30, saving 30% by 30, you know, go, can be traced to, you know, Half Earth. There was a book by E.O. Wilson, famed, you know, Harvard conservationist. Uh, so, you know, some indigenous people say like, oh, okay, white guy at Harvard says we ought to conserve half the earth. Like that's the way we've been living for thousands of years. Most of the remaining biodiversity is in the hands on lands of indigenous people. So how, will they be part of this and, and how are they going to be um, respected and incorporated in this process? That is, they have a lot more wisdom and experience than we do. They are absolutely right. And in fact, it's interesting, right, that in 2010, because this sort of conference meets every 10 years to set the goals, this was not really considered. Uh, but now, ever since I've been involved with this for three years, there are three main principles. Number one is to achieve the 30 by 30 internationally. Number two is to make sure there's financing. You can't say to a country in Africa that can't feed its own people, oh, why don't you go and preserve this land and not feed your people? So we have to have financing from wealthy countries. But the third principle is the protection and establishment of the rights of indigenous people. The famous first national parks in Congo, they kicked the indigenous people out. I've met with indigenous people in Uganda and others who have been displaced and you're absolutely right. These are the people that know the most about it, that know how to handle the diversity there, have so much to teach us. So uh, a mechanism has been created through the Campaign for Nature and through the, the Convention on Biodiversity, where lands where indigenous people are still living will be counted as preserved under certain conditions. In other words, the lands can't be sold out to mining companies, you know, to, to mine the whole thing. But there has to be a major change in the attitude about the role of indigenous people and is one of the three fundamental principles that this campaign for nature is all about. And I suspect, in fact, the negotiations are going on now. It's a stumbling block, but they're going to get over it. And the language needs to be very strong on protecting the role of indigenous people with regard to biodiversity. About 12% of the U.S. lands are protected under some form of protection now. There needs to be another 18% or so to get to this 30% goal. In your state, 82% of land is privately owned. And in states like Nebraska and Kansas, it's 90, almost 100% of land is in private hands. Does that mean that private landowners are going to have their land taken away to be conserved? <laughs> No, it does not. And in fact, uh, the president put out a wonderful report this year uh, with his secretary of interior, who's the first uh, indigenous person uh, to ever serve in that position called the America, the beautiful plan that basically endorses the idea of 30 by 30, but it explicitly talks about working with property owners, working with ranchers, 
working with farmers. There are a lot of people here at my alma mater, the University of Wisconsin-Madison, who have gone around the, uh, Canada and the United States working with ranchers saying, look, you can have wolves, you can have grizzly bears, you can have these things right here in your land without giving up your private property rights. And they've taught them how to do it. And apparently there's enormous enthusiasm. So these two things don't have to be incompatible. And lands that are still privately owned can be part of the solution here. And our culture is deeply human-centered. Declining biodiversity is invisible to most people. They don't see how a connection, maybe they understand bees, pollinate food. They're like, okay, that's a problem. How do you get people to connect and care about biodiversity when they don't see a direct personal connection? It's hard, but, you know, there's a couple of levels to this. The truth is that if you have the continuing exploitation of agricultural areas, huge sh food shortages will occur throughout the world. These big palm oil uh, forests or uh, operations in Indonesia and others lead to the loss of biodiversity. And then you have the loss of pollination. I mean, even one example, even though people don't see this, is apparently people that love guitars are very concerned about monkeys in ebony, near ebony trees in Africa. Why? Because without the monkeys, the seeds for the ebony trees don't get moved around. And the ebony trees can't survive. So sometimes it's a two-step thing. On the other hand, I think a lot of people realize that Certain animals and certain things that used to be around aren't around as much. In fact, I saw a study that since I was in high school, 50 years, 1970, when Earth Day started, we've lost 30% of all the sort of normal birds you would see in North America. 30% of them. They're gone. And so people might say, well, there's some birds around. Well, there are not as many there used to be. On the other hand, through environmental efforts, we have animals that we never had before. Across the street from where I am right now, there's a conservancy. Sandhill cranes all over the place. Wild turkeys. Um, and so it's a mixed picture where people might say, well, you know, there's, there's more than there used to be when I was young. But the fundamental concern about land usage and about not preserving enough, it is ultimately very threatening to people's stability and to the stability of our society. Well, Senator, we have to wrap it up there. Thank you for your time and for your, your thought and your insight and your leadership. It's been a pleasure. It was fun. Thanks so much. You're listening to a conversation about the relationship between the climate crisis and democracy. This is Climate One. Coming up, how can the president use the Defense Production Act, or DPA, to address the climate crisis? The DPA is a tremendous tool that the president can pull right now to coordinate private companies together. This is our chance to manufacture solar panels, wind turbines, EVs, storage, and all the structures that we need to essentially transition our country off of fossil fuels. That's up next when Climate One continues. This is Climate One. I'm Greg Dalton. Congress, of course, isn't the only branch of government that has the power to address the climate crisis. The president also has power to act. One of those powers is the Defense Production Act, or DPA. Climate One correspondent Julie Hantman spoke with two guests about invoking executive and emergency powers to address the climate emergency. Dan Farber is a constitutional scholar and faculty director of the Center for Law, Energy, and the Environment at UC Berkeley. He's author of Contested Ground, How to Understand the Limits of Presidential Power. Gene Sue is Senior Attorney and Energy Justice Director at the Center for Biological Diversity. She co-authored the recent report, The Climate President's Emergency Powers, which urges the president to declare a climate emergency. Here's Julie Hantman. Let's lay out the basics. Dan Farber, the U.S. president has the power to declare national emergencies under the National Emergencies Act. What is an emergency declaration and how does it work? The declaration by itself doesn't do anything. It's only a declaration. But once the president issues the declaration, there are about 136 other laws that refer to national emergency powers. And so the declaration allows the president or uh, government agencies to take advantage of those laws to maybe do things 
that otherwise they wouldn't be able to do. President Biden's most recent executive order to ban Russian imports was actually under a national emergency declaration. So he used um, the uh, the International Emergency Economic Powers Act, an acronym that I just say IEPA and always forget the actual words. That is actually one of the most used emergency powers that presidents have used in the past. And basically, very quickly after Russia invaded Ukraine, he pulled that lever and banned um, the imports of Russian oil very quickly. Dan, please remind us about a few notable national emergency declarations made by prior presidents and the actions the presidents took. And what was the sentiment at the time or your sentiment, executive overreach or needed authority? I think it varies. Sometimes it just varies by the uh, emergency, and sometimes it varies by how you feel about the policies, right? The most controversial ones that come to mind are those of President Trump. Uh, President Trump made pretty extensive use of emergency powers in, in what you could sometimes call creative ways, which is a lawyer's way of saying that they were maybe legally a bit dubious. The Example that I think of immediately is the border wall, where Trump declared an emergency at the southern border and then used that as a basis for moving around uh, defense funds that were supposed to go for other purposes, but he repurposed them uh, to build the wall. And he did that after Congress refused to give him the money. So it was really, you know, clearly, I don't care what Congress says, you know, I'm going to use my emergency powers. For some, I think, very justified uses of emergency powers, I would look to the COVID pandemic. Uh, For example, President Trump and uh, President Biden both used the Defense Production Act to get um, equipment and materials to manufacture vaccines and to to move those from other purposes. And I I haven't heard anyone complain about that. Jean Sue, you say unequivocally that President Biden should declare a climate emergency. Why and why now? So we are in an actual ticking time bomb right now with the climate change crisis. This is literally existential crisis for the planet and for all of our lives here. Climate scientists have given us a mandate across the world that if we want to actually have a pretty good chance at saving literally life on earth, we have to drastically change our energy system away from fossil fuels onto renewable energy on a very fast timeline. And for rich countries in particular, we know that that is within the next decade for sure. We, you know, at the Center for Biological Diversity and many folks um, from across the planet are urging for emergency actions. But on the other hand, the president has a tremendous amount of executive powers. So some of those are emergency powers, but many of those are actually ordinary powers. So for example, he can actually take many steps in banning fossil fuel leasing, or at the very least, reducing the rate at which it's happening right now, instead of what he is doing, which is pressing the gas pedal on it in the opposite direction. Jean, let's say Biden declares a climate emergency. What actions does your organization, the Center for Biological Diversity, want him to take? There are a few discrete actions that are limited in scope, but powerful in how they can change our fossil fuel system. So one of them, for example, is that the president has the power to halt crude oil exports leaving this country. In 2015, the Obama administration actually lifted a 40-year ban on crude oil exports leaving this country. From then until now, we have seen crude oil exports explode across this country with devastating impacts, particularly in the Permian Basin and all the black, brown and indigenous communities that live in those areas, all the way down to the export terminals in Texas. If he were to re-put the ban on crude oil exports, we would save 165 million tons of carbon equivalent. Uh, emissions, which actually equates to 42 coal plants shutting down. I say this with a very big caveat of we can't do this tomorrow um, in the sense of, you know, all of us right now are feeling the very real impacts of what the Ukraine-Russia war is doing to different volatile global um, prices and commodities on our fossil fuels. So we're not asking for an immediate, you know, 
turn off of the spigot. But what it does allow for is to understand what a managed phase out of fossil fuels would mean in this country. Recently, President Biden invoked the Defense Production Act, or DPA, to boost domestic production of minerals that are used in electric vehicle batteries. Gene, what is the DPA and what else would you like the DPA to be used for? So, you know, historically, the Defense Production Act was a statute that was passed to help the you know, the United States manufacturing base prepare for the Korean War. Um, so back in the day, it, it you know, it, it was a powerful tool to allow the president to command private companies and coordinate private companies together to manufacture weapons like tanks, like guns that the American military would need over overseas. And it is, it is a national defense statute. The Defense Production Act does not require an emergency declaration. One of the brilliant parts about the Defense Production Act is that during COVID, it was used for peacetime efforts. Um, and, and that's what we are looking for here. So as Dan had referred to, both President Trump and President Biden have pulled the Defense Production Act to coordinate private manufacturers to manufacture what is needed in for the national defense. Um, and during COVID, that is the war against this disease and getting companies to really get in gear to make the different ventilators, the masks, and the vaccines that we needed. When we think about this through the climate lens, the thing that we need to combat climate change in this country is renewable energy. Right now, the United States has a huge dearth of green manufacturing, and the DPA is a tremendous tool that the president and can pull right now to coordinate private companies together. This is our chance to manufacture solar panels, um, wind turbines, EVs, storage, and um, all the structures that we need to essentially transition our country off of fossil fuels. Are there other things that a president might do with a climate emergency, Dan? One is potentially an emergency could be used to accelerate the regulatory process. Um, another thing would be using uh, the same mechanism that Trump used for the wall to reallocate defense construction funding uh, to use for defense-related climate projects, which could be significant. Jean? There is a an interesting transportation power that would allow TSA in particular to uh, coordinate transportation broadly across the United States. One could see the possibility of crafting stronger regulations on emissions of vehicles. What are the likely political and judicial ramifications of declaring a climate emergency right now? You know, I think de declaring an emergency, it seems to me, could be politically helpful, at least in dramatizing the urgency of the situation. Um, on the other hand, I think some of the bolder actions that you could take under the emergency powers, if, for example, banning uh, fossil fuel exports or financing of projects or something like that, I, you know, I could imagine that you could get a, a, a number of the uh, moderate Democrats uh, and certainly the swing voters like Cinema and Mansion, you know, might go a little bit nuts. Um, I think the other imponderable uh, is uh, the Democrats are in trouble in the midterm elections. Biden's popularity is low, and what one president can do, another president can wipe out, and that's uh, I think a real limitation. That's one of the reasons why legislation is so important because that's much harder. Uh, to get rid of. There's no way that emergency powers would be a substitute for the Build Back Better law or the Green New Deal or something like that. Um, I do worry about pushback from the conservative judges, and I worry about whether doing things which strike them as really kind of wild and crazy would actually hurt your chances in terms of other cases. I think my biggest concern is one we haven't talked about, which is executive powers are great, but in terms of our system of government, it's not the greatest thing for us to be throwing all the checks and balances out the window. And um, I think there, you know, I think there's a cost and to sort of building the idea of the president as sort of a lone 
Rambo figure, you know, taking on the world and not needing Congress and not needing, you know, ignoring courts and stuff like that. Um, I think in the end, I'm less enthusiastic than Gene. I would prefer to see what happens with the other levers. For example, if it looks like the Supreme Court's really going to cut back on EPA's power under the Clean Air Act, if they come out with a really really damaging opinion, then to me, use of emergency powers looks a lot more appealing. And and I agree with Dan on that. I, you know, for an administration that has in a lot of ways very much put most of their climate eggs into a legislative basket. And so given these choices in their first year to year and a half, and given where legislation is right now, which is at, on life support for climate. So we see a, a far kind of broader set of Democrats now understanding that legislation may not be passed. And so they are signaling essentially um, to President Biden that maybe he should consider some of these executive powers to really act boldly on climate. I don't advocate a Rambo, you know, in, in, in the presidency. You know, we're really kind of looking at them to leverage what they have and what they what they have legally. Well, thank you, Dan Farber and Jean Sue, for this great conversation. Thanks for having us. Thank you for having us. That was correspondent Julie Hantman discussing climate and democracy with Gene Sue, Energy Justice Director at the Center for Biological Diversity, and Dan Farber, Faculty Director of the Center for Law, Energy, and the Environment at UC Berkeley. Climate One's empowering conversations connect all aspects of the climate emergency. To hear more, subscribe to our podcast on Apple or wherever you get your pods. Talking about climate can be difficult, awkward, sometimes depressing, and it's critical to address the transitions we need to make in all parts of society. Please help us get people talking more about climate by giving us a rating or review if you're listening on Apple. You can do it right now on your device. You can also help by sending a link to this episode to a friend. By sharing that, you can help people have their own deeper climate conversations. Brad Marsland is our senior producer. Our producers and audio editors are Ariana Brocious and Austin Cologne. Our team also includes Steve Fox and Sarah Catherine Coxon. Our theme music was composed by George Young and arranged by Matt Wilcox. Gloria Duffy is CEO of the Commonwealth Club of California, the nonprofit and nonpartisan forum where our program originates. I'm Greg Dalton. <laughs>